Uh, welcome, Les Cohn, to this uh, oral history interview. My name is Uday Kapoor. I am a member of the Computer History Museum's Oral Histories Program. With me is my colleague, Doug Fairbairn, and we will both be interviewing you, Les, so welcome. Thank you. So first, uh, a short introduction. Les Cohn, who is very well known in the Valley as a uh, architect's architect <laughs> uh, and an entrepreneur. Uh, he was born in Oakland in 1956 and grew up in San Mateo. And uh, that's really uh, all that I have in your early part of your life, but we can get started with that. Um, it seems you are a prodigy. You were five, four years old when your dad taught you how to use a slide rule. So well, yeah, tell kind us of. a little bit about your <laughs> early childhood. Um, well, my dad was an engineer and actually he uh, worked at a company designing um, high performance mechanical calculators at, at the time. And so um, he was always showing me all various gadgets, including this slide rule. And, uh, you know, I think at that point, I didn't really understand what multiplication was, but he just showed me, you know, how to line up the various uh, scales and, and what the results look like. So it was, uh, for you, it was like a toy. Yes. Right? <laughs> so that's wonderful. And um, you, in fact, within a few years after that, you uh, started with your personal computer. And we can talk a little bit about that, uh, three-bit Digicomp. That's right. That was uh, another one of these uh, toys of that era, which um, it had like three uh, sliding mechanical flip-flops. And they had these little pegs that you would stick on onto different uh, positions. And, an, and a, another sliding uh, thing that was like a clock and you could cause it to cycle through various states. And so see, tell know. us about your family then. Uh, you, you mentioned your dad. How about your siblings? Uh, were they all like you or what kind of schooling did you get? So talk a little bit about your early life. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I have two brothers, both younger than me. Um, and one of them is also um, an engineer in Silicon Valley, working at Juniper. And the other one um, is, is uh, programming, um, but uh, took a little bit different path to get there. Uh, when growing up, uh, we went to public schools and uh, luckily they did have a nice um, gifted program which I took advantage of uh, to get some early exposure to computer stuff. Okay, so, so it looks like you, you had a real desire and a fascination with computers uh, from an early life. Yeah. You said there was a poster of a CDC 6600 on your wall Right, which so, I, I, I got from a neighbor that was throwing it away. But um, yeah, it was something, I guess I was always attracted to it. I can also recall um, reading articles in National Geographic about the um, ILLIAC-4, this massive parallel computing system. And I was always intrigued by these things with big consoles of flashing lights and um, that kind of stuff. Right. Were you, Les, were you, uh, did you get into any other like mechanical stuff, erector sets, anything uh, else? Sure. I mean, I had the Lego blocks and uh, yeah, I had this, uh, the, I forget the, yeah, the erector set, that kind of stuff. And was your father sort of the major influence in that? Is that something you just sort of picked up? Uh, and I mean, certainly he was uh, an influence and I think it was, it was just always something that I can recall being interested in, in science and math and that kind of stuff. 
So you mentioned that um, you played with a six relay and a motorized rotary switch computer in school. Right. Um, can that you was, tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, that was in, in sixth grade in this, um, in this uh, gifted program. Um, and they, uh, they bought this thing. I don't exactly remember how we found it, but um, it was like what you could get at that time for for learning how computers work. And um, it, it had these six relays, which you could hook up with um, like diodes and resistors to generate um, different kinds of logic operations. And then there was this, um, the output devices were a set of lights plus this uh, mechanical switch that had a motor on it. And you could program it such that it would, turn and, and then stop at a particular position. And that was your output. And the whole thing was connected together with patch cords. I see. So what was the gifted program like? Uh, who are your colleagues? Um, uh, did you stay in touch with them till later or? Um, yeah, so it was a program, basically the whole school district, San Mateo school district, um, they would, I guess that do these testing and then um, select, I think we had about 30 kids um, for that class. Uh, and then they um, bust them all to a central uh, school where we could all uh, be together in class and then they offer special uh, enhanced stuff. So like there was some um, math teacher that they brought in from the high school to teach us some uh, advanced math stuff. And, um, you know, they, they gave us these extra toys to play with and so on. Um, and I do, I, I made one really good friend there who I actually went to school with at Caltech. Um, and we, we kept in touch, not, he's in New York now, so, you know, I don't talk to him regularly, but um, definitely, there was some interesting people there. <laughs> I can imagine. Uh, so what was the, as you mentioned something about that, they brought in math teacher, were mm -hmm. there other exposures to programming, for example, or? So um, <clears throat> beyond this computer in the seventh grade, um, they also, um, introduced me to um, someone who, who was, had contacts with Stanford um, and was able to get me into their, um, their um, 360, 67, nice. humongous um, um, data center. And um, I don't exactly recall how I picked it up, but I wrote a Fortran program to compute prime numbers. Right and punched it. They took me there. I, I had basically one day to, to go in there, key punch it, and then run it. And, you know, as you, it was all batch, right? So you run it, something doesn't work, you get back this printout and you right. <laughs> iterate on that until you get something. And you mentioned also a Heath kit, analog computer kit that you played. Right, with. that was an eighth grade um, school district. I was kind of into electronic kits at that time. I also had a, my, my dad bought me an oscilloscope kit and a multimeter. Um, and then there was this analog computer that the school district bought, which also was all vacuum tube based. Um, so it's basically these vacuum tube op amps and it had a meter on it that was the output device. And you could program it to do like, uh, solve differential equations, that kind of stuff. Right. So in terms of overall concepts, you know, in terms of theoretical concepts, uh, you were getting that training in school and then you were curious and you were applying it to all these experiments. Is that how it was working? Um, yeah, I mean, it wasn't so much that there was a lot of training because the at that time, you know, the teachers were not really on, on right. computer stuff, <laughs> but I, I got exposed to, um, you know, I got to play with these computers 
and I kind of picked up stuff on my own and, um, you know, read books and that kind of stuff. Mm. Okay, you must have done a lot of reading, yes, of course. Yeah. Um, you developed computer games and simulations on IBM 1620 in the junior college, PDP right. 811, IBM 360. Right, yeah, that was another lucky thing that, you know, our junior college had um, a couple of computers at that time, and they, one of them was the 1620, which was a scientific computer and also program with punch cards. But in that case, you know, you could go in and play, sit, sit at the console of the computer and run programs. And it had a kind of a selectric typewriter <laughs> output device that you could do interactive stuff with. And uh, the other great thing about that computer was it had, <clears throat> it was a decimal computer and it had all the um, multiply and add tables stored in the core storage. And you could watch, like you could give it this humongous multiply and you could see on the lights that how it was cycling through the memory when it was doing multiplies and stuff. But, but you were doing all this work uh, in, when you were in high school, right? Uh, actually, I think this started in eighth grade, yeah, okay. right before high school. You had, uh, you were fortunate to get access to a lot of yeah, I was really lucky. computing stuff and yeah. other things, so that's great. Were there any other major developments in high school? Any uh, things, teachers or whatever, that kind of steered you in certain directions? Well, in high school, um, I had they had a very good math science department, um, and I also um, got early access to the junior college math um, math courses. So I I took calculus in tenth grade, and. Um, <clears throat> and uh, second year stuff in, in 11th grade before graduating. Um, so that plus access to um, DEC had an office in, uh, I don't recall whether it was in Mountain View or something, but anyway, I managed to get access to some of the early like PDP-8, PDP-11 computers. Um, and then our, our school district bought it a really low end 360 system that they use to run time sharing basic across all the schools in the school district. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. So it sounds like from a math and uh, other studies, you were two or three years ahead. You were already doing second year college yeah, in probably. high school in 11th grade. And physics was another really uh, passion that I, I got involved in and then <laughs> Um, you know, when I went to Caltech, I... Yeah, so that's an interesting uh, segue because I, I noticed that and I was going to ask you, how did you, uh, what uh, inspired you uh, to get into physics? Um, you know, fundamentally, I, I, I like to look at, understand things, you know, at a deep level. And um, at some point, I realized that you know, there's kind of two worlds that humans are exposed to. There's the external world, which is basically described by physics at the most fundamental level. And then there's the internal world that's going on inside your brain. And that's actually more closely related to what, what computers are doing, how they compute things. <clears throat> so I guess that's, that's how I ended up on these two branches, um, physics and, and computers. Right, how about mathematics? Well, mathematics was something that I, I would say, I wasn't so interested in pure mathematics, but as a tool for um, you know, understanding physics and computing, of course. Okay. Very important. How, how did you end up going to Caltech? Were there other choices? Was, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Caltech, of course, was well known for physics, um, being a top physics school and um, it's also a small school, which allows you to have, as an undergraduate, to have a lot more access to faculty and research stuff. Um, so that was attractive. And um, I, I, you know, I, I applied to MIT, got into MIT, but I, I just decided to, um, to select Caltech because of the size and the physics um, 
orientation. So, so you were uh, not so much curious about physics uh, in terms of um, modern physics or theoretical physics, but applied physics. Uh, no, no, actually I was quite interested in theoretical physics. Oh, I see. Know? Because I, I <clears throat> my dad gave me a book. Um, I don't know whether it was junior high school or not, but it was a book on um, quantum mechanics. And okay. that whole, it was quite a shock to me because in, I think like fifth or sixth grade, they showed you these atoms with these uh, little balls of electrons spinning around. And when I found out that that whole model just doesn't, you know, it doesn't work. <laughs> that was a, quite a shock and um, really got me interested into, into fundamental theoretical physics. Right. But it seems you didn't pursue that uh, later, right? So you- still... Right, not after, um, after graduating because I did realize when, when I was going um, to school at Caltech, um, to really do physics professionally requires, first of all, you have to definitely have to have a PhD. And I was getting a little bit tired of school at that point. <laughs> um, and one of the things that kind of turned me off was um, they would teach you these really, you know, advanced techniques for that you need to, to do like leading edge physics, but they would, in school, they would have to apply it to a trivial problem. So they say, you know, use tensor formulation to solve force between two electrons, which is a completely wrong way of, of solving that problem. Um, but that's what you had to do on the homework. And so I, that kind of turned me off and, and um, I decided to, to get a real job to competing. <laughs> Okay. Uh, so it I looked like a, a lot of your uh, actual hands-on stuff. You actually did a lot of computer, computer and computer. Sure. Stuff. And, and, and in fact, uh, at Caltech, I, I took um, a number of computer science and doubly digital electronics classes. And I, I did a research project um, with a couple uh, fellow students there that really kind of set me on this path in my career. Right, so you, uh, at Caltech, you did a summer job, Citibank, uh, EFT terminal software, writing 8080 assembly language. Yeah, that was a, actually at a startup company that <clears throat> the founder um, of that company, he, he actually had an earlier company that did one of the earlier um, stock terminals, stock trading terminals. And he knew he had a lot of contacts at, at Citibank. And they gave him a contract to develop this uh, EFT terminal. And so, you know, we, we did it based on ADA and mm. some proprietary hardware encryption engine that they had. I see. And as you were saying, you took computer science classes. It seems like you got into programming languages. Um, right. Yeah, so um, Caltech had, they had a professor, I mean, they didn't have the world's best uh, computer science department because that wasn't really their focus, but they did have um, a professor who was involved in some of the early structured programming, um, mm -hmm. which was just kind of coming onto the scene at that time. Um, and so he like taught Pascal as a, programming language and, <clears throat> and we did a compiler development in that class and it really kind of got me interested in, in programming languages and how to um, uh, improve pro programming productivity. But I think at that time, what was really um, unsolved was how to apply these programming languages to system programming. Um, because people were mainly doing application programming in, in Fortran and stuff, but they were using assembly language for operating system. Right. And so um, that, that was something that our research project that, that I mentioned, that, that was kind of the goal of that project was to develop a um, programming language for, for system programming. And it also was, you know, 
you know, tried to be structured programming and included um, this concept of, um, of generic types. So you could define things like a linked list type that could work with any type of list element, um, that kind of thing. Who, who was that professor? Uh, per, per Brink Hansen, I think. Okay. Did you work with uh, Chuck Seitz or Carver Mead? Or well, so, well, Carver Mead, I took this digital, um, digital design class from and the lab mm -hmm. where we built uh, kind of a 2D Pong game. Um, and at, just on my senior year um, is when uh, Ivan Sutherland, he, he just mm -hmm. joined Caltech at that time. So I did get introduced to him, mm -hmm. but I didn't really take classes from them. Mm -hmm. Did you know another student, Jim Rousen there? I don't recall. Probably a couple of years, probably a graduate student at the time, but working with Carver and... Uh, anyway. Yeah, I mean, I, I ended up, when I went to Intel, I kind of reconnected with some of the stuff that Carver was doing um, with, with Intel and some of the other guys at that time. Okay. So uh, transitioning from school to um, first job, uh, right. can you tell us about how that happened? So, you know, after I decided not to go to grad school, um, I moved back to my parents' house in, in San Mateo and um, just started looking around for various job, job <coughs> openings. So you said you, you were sort of tired of school? Is that what? Yeah, I okay. got, got a little bit burned out at the end. <laughs> okay. um, but I, uh, so I interviewed around at a few different companies and and one of the companies was had an opening was National Semiconductor, which had a um, job to, they were looking for someone to kind of help them develop a, a processor based on these bit slice, um, like these 2901 type bit slice right. uh, designs. Um, and they had been looking at this, um, at that time there was this U US, UCSD Pascal implementation, which was uh, basically a stack-based compiler. And, you know, the idea was to implement this stack-based um, instruction set directly in the 2901 implementation. Mm -hmm. So I joined them to, uh, to work on that project. You call it configurable data flow? Well, so... <clears throat> After I got there, I, um, I got, I don't know, interested in, in moving beyond just this kind of stack-based architecture, which it was pretty clear was, was not a um, scalable performance solution, right? Um, in fact, even relative to register-based machines, it's, it's not particularly efficient. Um, design so it's very easy to generate code for, but it's it's um, it doesn't have good performance. So um, I started to look at um, alternative kinds of architectures, processing architectures, and you know I guess <clears throat> the big challenge in in general purpose processor architectures is how to scale performance um, with parallel execution and. So I, um, I, I just looked at all different kinds of, of implementations. Um, and one of the ideas that I was playing around with was um, a way to, you know, to connect multiple uh, data processing operations into uh, a data flow graph and um, and basically execute all of them in parallel. But at the time, it was really um, beyond the scope of what, what you could really look at implementing. Uh, yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that at Umbrella. <laughs> yeah, so uh, ended up using many it. years later, I, I actually ended up coming back and implementing it. But, yeah. yeah. 
So at that time, National, uh, of course, was not in the microprocessor business, right? Well, they were. They were, <laughs> they, they were in the business, but they weren't particularly successful. Okay. But um, they, they were selling um, like an early 8-bit microcontroller. And they had ambition to try to take on Intel. <laughs> and they, they hired uh, one of the key designers from Intel come over and, um, and I end up working with him along with um, one of the students that worked on this uh, programming language project with me at Caltech, um, Dan O'Dowd. And um, so I, I managed to entice Dan to join National and the two of us um, took on the, the architecture for this, this microprocessor project that was supposed to, at the time, I guess the, the, big, um, the big thing that National wanted to go after was the 8086. Um, but we kind of realized that, you know, 16-bit architecture was already running out of gas and it made sense to go to um, a 32-bit type of architecture. So at that time, um, the most famous 32-bit uh, processor was the VAX 11780. Right. Um, right. And we ended up doing a machine that was, I think, similar in style to a, a 780, um, memory to memory plus register architecture. Um, but of course, it had to be optimized to fit into a microprocessor implementation. Right. So you needed good floating point. Uh, um, floating point was part of it. Yeah, we, we pretty much wanted to go be able to run any kind of software that you would run on a VAX to be able to run it on this microprocessor. So that meant we needed both floating point and virtual memory uh, right. architecture. And so we ended up with a three chip implementation. Um, CPU, which did all the integer operations a memory management unit that did the address translation and then the uh, floating point unit. Um, so that. who was the person from Intel that joined He's mentioned? Uh, Svi Soha. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think I've met him, yes. So how did you, in retrospect, um, you know, what was your evaluation of that uh, major project? Was it the Right, you know, was it the best you could do at the time? Was it overdone for what was uh, cost effective? I mean, you know, how did you feel independent of the marketing mm. success? Sort of what- uh, I mean, I think it was probably the best you could do for that type of architecture at that time. The CPU budget, we only had 60,000 transistors to play with, right? And that was already considered a huge chip by national standards, you know, which they were selling a lot of flip-flops and stuff. So <laughs> um, you know, I think in that respect, technically um, it was a, a good product, um, but you know, on the business side, the, it didn't really fit into the culture of the company and the, and the kind of sales force they had and the, <clears throat> the market position they had. So it was a, difficult to make it commercially successful. Um, so but, uh, what, yeah. what kind of tools did you have to, you know, build the models and mm -hmm. check the performance and run programs? Yeah, we had a, a VAX 11780. <laughs> and, uh, and for the physical design, it was um, just at the point where they were, they had this advanced computer aided design that involved basically manually drafting and then digitizing all yeah, the uh, of course. <laughs> patterns and stuff. Yeah. So then you, of course, uh, Israel comes into being. Right. Uh, how did that uh, happen? Why did you select Israel for building? Well, this? of course, Zvi Soha is from Israel. Right. And um, at that time, Intel had actually set up I think an early, you know, design center there, um, and was expanding there. And I think, um, the, you know, the idea was get access to a lot of good engineers right. um, that you might not be able to hire in Silicon Valley. And 
I see. And uh, that's why it's, yeah, it's interesting that I visited the design center in Israel in um, Herzliya, mm -hmm. uh, the National Design Center, because we were, I was with Synertech and we were thinking of second sourcing. So this is a few years later. Mm -hmm. I met a lot of the people that were there, the people that uh, you had hired and built the team. Yes, um, it was a, a really good team. Um, what what was, was your role in what was your role in setting up that design center and what were the goals and sort of sound like V was the sort of driver in terms of location but sort of what was the driving force in terms of uh, from a business point of view or design point of view? Well, the driving force was to build a team that could you know develop um, leading edge microprocessors that could compete with Intel. Um, and, uh, you know, what I was involved with there was basically, you know, when, since this thing was built from scratch, I, you know, basically went over there when they first got the building and kind of, um, you know, helped them uh, from a technical point of view, helped them um, set the direction for how to, like the microarchitecture design of the chip is something that Dan and I kind of worked out the basic ideas. And, you know, this, it was a microcoded machine. So we did some of the early microcode development for it and um, we're, helped them build the simulation models for it and uh, just made sure as architects do, you know, that, that everyone on the team understands what the chip is supposed to be doing and answer questions. So oh, oh, oh. you had done the architecture uh, with with Dan, Dan, yes. Dan and right. uh, but then all the implementation and detail work was done at the Israeli Design Center. Is that correct? For the chip design, yes. Yeah, right. We also. Yes. Sorry. It's interesting that uh, there was a fear. This is, of course, a few years before that about the location because of all the wars. That's right. And I think yeah. a lot of the hard by Do Froman and Vinchkowski on the Intel side uh, to sell that idea to Intel mm -hmm. management to establish that, you know, fab and the design there. And so I think you were probably <laughs> reaping the rewards from that, right? Yeah, I mean, I actually, even at the time that I, I first went over there, it was still, I, I guess what you read about, like in the papers, about how bad it is, um, when you actually go there, you get a lot different perspective because um, what I quickly realized is you were much more likely to get killed in a car crash the way people are driving than, than by a bomb. So um, yeah, it's, right. Right. it's something you have to see firsthand. Did you actually live over there for a couple of years or what was your- I was there for a total of about six months. It wasn't continuous because I would, Kind of go there for a month or two then come back and, and so on. What would you say was the major learning that you had from doing this uh, chip? What are the lessons you took from that and said well I'm not going to do that or I will certainly do that the next time or whatever sort of what was sure the... well <clears throat> I mean the first thing is I, I learned how to d design a microprocessor which you know this is the first first time I'd ever been involved in something like that and understanding the full scope of all the steps that you have to go through to build a, a complex chip. Um, but the thing that I, I really learned that I decided, you know, we had to do differently in the future was when I started working on the next generation of that chip um, to scale the performance up, that this micro-coded style implementation of complex instructions you, you end up hitting this bottleneck. So the, the thing that you have to do to, to scale beyond the traditional microcode machine is you have to go to a pipeline design so that you can execute one instruction per clock. And once you start to do that, this whole microcode concept breaks down because now you have a whole bunch of instructions in flight and you know there's no single stage that you can just execute a, a microcode program to, to work on an instruction. So 
I, I realized um, that this pipeline implementation would be much more challenging for, for the CISC instruction sets. And then I happened to get some papers from, um, I think it was from Dave Patterson on their um, risk project at Berkeley, the first risk project that they had. And I looked at that and realized, yes, this is, <laughs> makes much more sense for a pipeline Im implementation. And that should be the direction for, for the next projects. So that was the level of complexity at that time, not real IW and- That's and right. So. You're just trying to get a basic pipeline machine going. <clears throat> and you also worked on a network workstation there, is that correct? <clears throat> right. So, yeah, so, <clears throat> um, you know, during the development of this microprocessor, it was clear that this, this kind of processor um, performance wise was actually a lot better than the, the mainframes and, and VAX 11 780s that, that we were using to um, design it. So it was pretty clear that this was gonna change the direction of, of computing um, in the future. And so we should rethink what what's the right kind of computing systems that um, you know, that makes sense for microprocessor um, based processing. And so in looking at the cost of, of the computing system, at that time, the hard disk was this super expensive thing. Like I can remember even I think in 1986, which was, you know, many years after this project, I bought a 10 megabyte hard disk for a thousand dollars. Like that was, a, <laughs> yeah. so that was a kind of a killer cost. So what we decided to do was to, um, you know, develop a uh, architecture where you have, each person has his own workstation, but you share the, the file storage across them. So in order to do that, you need a network. And so we had developed this concept and um, national after some, political battles, they, they actually let us um, kick off this program and, and we hired a software team to work on it. And we did hire um, um, someone from Xerox Park who was familiar with the kind of um, GUI interface stuff that they were developing. So we kind of got motivated to work on that kind of stuff. Um, who was that that you hired from Park? Uh, his name was Peter something. I don't remember his last name. Actually, unfortunately, it's been too many years. But um, anyway, we, you know, we had a bitmap display. We had a joystick instead of a mouse, unfortunately. But um, we had, you know, this UI system. We had the compiler that was going to use this, uh, this kind of language concepts that we've been working on at Caltech. And we had our own OS. So it was a super ambitious program, but uh, very fun to work on and learned a lot of things not to do next time. So, so did National think they were gonna go into the workstation business or was this- Yeah, you know, you know, at that time National, they had um, a mainframe business selling um, 370 compatible mainframes. So, they were a great company to try lots of different things, not all of them successful. <laughs> so in terms of the National Design Center or the, national, the whole establishment there, uh, you know, unlike Intel, where I think people were fairly loyal, there was a migration out. And I think, I mean, I got to know many of the people there that ended up in the EDA world or mm -hmm. other startups, they went to Motorola and, uh, they started the Motola group in Israel. So I think they're very talented people, but they migrated out, would you say? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> there was um, a VP at the time, Pierre Lamont, I don't know. If he's oh, Pierre name. Lamont, yes. But he was, you know, he was a kind of a champion for these high-tech um, projects. Right. And, right. and then at some point he, he left and I think a lot of people couldn't. Right. <laughs> couldn't uh, make it there anymore. 
So yeah. what, uh, tell me about Peter, or, um, Pierre, what was your relationship with him and sort of was he? Yeah, that was, it was interesting because, um, you know, I was just a kid out of school. And uh, so I, he was probably like four levels above me, but because of this project, this um, microprocessor family was one of his pet projects. Um, I did get to talk to him and um, kind of, and he I, I managed to convince him to start that software project that, that I talked about. <laughs> and, yeah. yeah. I'm sure he also recognized a creative person when he saw one. So, yeah. and he was on the board of Cypress Semiconductor. I remember he. And also CQ. Where I worked. I see. Right. Yeah, I mean, you, you sort of, sort of worked together in various forms. Yeah, I mean, years. I don't think we really worked together, but yes, we, yeah. we did cross paths. Yes. <laughs> So then on. To, so, so what, what happened there? to that project? What what yeah. I mean, you know, what the sixteen thousand, the the workstation project. So um, you know, after Pierre left, and I kind of realized that it would be pretty difficult to finish that project, given the direction the company was going. Um, so I started to look outside and um, and then I, you know, one of the things I, I wanted to do was I, I knew National was a great place to, you know, to explore things that you would never be able to do at a company like Intel coming out of school, but I really wanted to learn what was, you know, involved in a really successful microprocessor company. So mm -hmm. I, um, that's why I decided to go to Intel. And after that, I think the, the group kind of disbanded. You know, people just went right. different directions. Dan ended up um, starting this Green Hills software company, which is still um, developing kind of leading edge software tools today for, for um, embedded applications. Yeah, he's been there for a long time. Yeah, I don't know if you guys have interviewed him, but he. No, I was just, I, I saw him on, you know, you referenced him and then it sounds like he was a couple of years older than you at Caltech. Uh, uh, one year. One, one year. year. Mm -hmm. I, I figured he was the one that got you to national, but it was the other way around. Is that right? Right. You, you went to national and he had gone somewhere else. Yeah, he actually, um, he went to grad school for, I think, about a year and then also oh. got tired of school and, um, <laughs> and then he, he went to um, a startup that a Caltech guy had founded that actually was developing um, the software for these early Mattel handheld games. I don't know if you remember these things, but anyway, um, yeah, he was at that company when I got him to come to National. Right. So when you went to Intel, um, what was the, what for, why, why did they hire you? I mean, what you were looking at alternative architectures? Oh, actually at that time, you know, Intel, they had this kind of 32 bit microprocessor crisis, right? Um, right. Because, well, the, the interesting thing about Intel is the, the senior management of the company, you know, they all came from kind of the semiconductor process and, and device physics side of things. And so they didn't really understand computer architecture. Um, you know, they, they were the leader in microprocessors, but um, it wasn't from the, the work of the senior management. And, right. and so um, what was happening is, um, as you basically for the 32-bit generation, they decided to um, do this 432 project. I don't know if right. you're familiar with that, but um, it was more or less completely the wrong direction um, <laughs> right. for, for, for them. Um, but they had kind of, they didn't see it for a long time. They didn't realize that that was true. And, and so they started this 8086 project as kind of a panic 
thing to get something out quick that could hold their position in the market until this 432 would come in and take over. And of course it didn't work out that way. So they, they realized that they needed to look at other 32 bit alternatives. And they hired um, a guy named Glenn Myers. I don't know if you're mm. familiar with him, yes. but from IBM. And um, he was supposed to develop the next generation mainstream 32-bit architecture for Intel, um, which was actually the project that I got hired into uh, as an architect on that project. Um, but it, as it happens, at the same time, they had another project, which was um, started by the 432 architects, where they had um, made a deal with Siemens to do a joint development um, on this next generation 432 architecture. Um, so that was you know, basically going on at the same time as this project. Um, <clears throat> and in addition, there was a, like a 32-bit DSP project going on. So there was like several 32-bit architecture projects all going on at the same time. And at some point, um, you know, Intel management realized that was too many. Um, but I also, when I came in, I, I, um, I wanted to do this risk project because I, I had also realized that, um, you know, from, from what I was doing at National, that that should be the right direction for the 32-bit. Um, but because there were so many 32-bit projects going on at the same time, I could never get that off the ground. Um, whenever I tried to propose it, you know, they'd say, well, sorry, you know, it's, we made the decision to go with this one and that's, that's what we're going to do. So um, <clears throat> at some point they decided to merge the, um, the project that Glenn Myers was developing, which was kind of a, I would say another VAC style architecture um, um, with this, uh, the next generation 432 project. So and at that, yeah. I, I remember, uh, you know, I was uh, there at the same time uh, at Intel, and I was in the HIMO operation, which is the High Integration Microprocessor Group, and I think you were part of the HPMO, High Performance. Right. Mm -hmm. And I remember you walking around with uh, Cornet, uh, yeah, yes. Jean Claude Cornet. Yes. Uh, he is another character, maybe. Definitely. You can... <laughs> Uh, tell us so, a lot. So what was this project that merged? Um... So <clears throat> it was a it, internal code name was the P4 for the project that um, was the back style architecture. And then there was this um, P5 project, I think was the was it P7. Anyway, um, <clears throat> it was the, the organ next generation 432 project that was being done with Siemens and combined with this um, Santa Clara um, VAC style architecture project. And when they combined the, the two things together, they moved the whole thing up into Oregon. And I, uh, you know, I was offered to move up there. I was a little bit reluctant to do that. So I kind of was commuting there a little bit back and forth between Santa Clara and Oregon. And I met, you know, a lot of the team members and, and they had a really, really great team in Oregon from chip design point of view, but unfortunately they were working on the wrong architecture. So um, <laughs> I ultimately decided not to, to move up there at that time. Right. So I was, uh, I became in charge of the P6 project, which is the one with the graphics. Uh -huh. yes, so, yes, I remember that one. So what, um, in, in all of these discussions of microprocessors, the, where did the issue of, hey, let's, let's make it compatible with all the previous generation stuff come Right, out? so, um, <clears throat> yeah. In addition to those 32-bit projects, there was another 32-bit project, um, which was the compatible one, which was the 386. Um, and again, at that time, 
this was not viewed as a long-term um, you know, architecture. It was more like a stopgap that was just to hold, hold the line until this beautiful next generation thing would, would take over. And um, I, uh, I did get involved in that um, first on the, the MMU side, the paging part, I kind of uh, helped define what that was gonna look like based on the stuff that we had done at National. Um, and then I got involved in the 387, which was a floating point part of it. And original uh, scheme that I was trying to, to do there was to make the 387 be a, a micro-coded floating point accelerator that was actually a, a risk machine, this. It had floating <laughs> point risk on it. one way or another here. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so it, the idea was, yeah, people could actually program it, um, offload stuff from the 386 and, and run this code on, on this floating point accelerator um, for high performance uh, processing. And that project did get started and it was um, being worked on in Israel the Intel Israel team. Um, but at some point um, they decided that that schedule was too late and cost was too high. So we ended up going back to a, just a hard, well, it wasn't really hardwired, but it was a dedicated um, uh, floating point coprocessor um, for the 387. So Itanium was started much later, right? Yeah, yeah. Itanium, that was, <laughs> it was the early stage of that project was right at the time I was leaving Intel. Okay. And, and it, that, that always struck me as a super ironic thing that the team that, you know, that <clears throat> developed the 386 that, you know, was so successful and in being a compatible evolution of the architecture would go down this path of, of yeah. incompatible thing. Meanwhile, the organ team, which had been developing the incompatible architecture, you know, took the, the x86 architecture and, and right. took it to the next level. So where did the 860 come in? So um, after the 386 generation, 386, 387 uh, was done, um, and after this uh, NEC lawsuit that I was involved in. Um, I, you know, I was also involved with that. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't realize you were too. That was another super educational thing <laughs> to do one time. All right, all right, let's start with that. What, was, what, what did you learn from that? And you know, what did you find interesting or boring about that? Well, a few things. First is, um, by the time you go through a lawsuit, the, the, you, you spend so many years doing that that you never really get any real result out of it, any real help from it. So don't, don't bother <coughs> Jenna. But um, I also learned that these lawyers are actually, <laughs> there's some pretty smart lawyers out there and the way they can <laughs> twist your words if you're not super careful is amazing. Um, no, I, I was I was going to mention that Tom Dunlap was in charge of that from Intel, right? And he didn't know anything about microcode, right? And so I was helping him. You know, we took a picture of the chip and all that, and trying to explain to him. Yeah. What microcode was. So there was this outside law firm that was handling the case, and I was kind of the co technical coordinator for for that, and. Um, one of the key th things that they were trying to prove in that case was that microcode was copy copyrightable. Because um, at that time, I think software, it was not really clear how you were gonna do IP protection for software. And I remember that they brought in this guy that he was a, like an ex attorney general and I had to explain to him, what is microcode and why is it like software? <laughs> And you know that, that was really fun, but um, and also the other really fun thing was to go over to Japan and take depositions of these engineers, um, which was one of my early Japan experiences. But you know, like I said, in the end, 
after you do all this work, and you know, we had Dave Patterson as an expert witness, we had to do all kinds of you know, prep work and stuff for that. And just so many people working for so long. And then at the very end of the case, turns out that the judge had owned a few shares of Intel stock in some fund that he didn't even realize. And so the whole thing was disqualified. You know, and they, had, <laughs> they had to retry it. And you know, it's it just such a waste of time and money. All right, so then you moved on to the 860? Yeah, so kind of, I think partially as a reward for helping them on this uh, lawsuit case. Um, yeah, they let, finally let me do a risk project, um, which I had been um, looking at, at like high performance floating point. Uh, what's the next step for that? And um, so with the 860 project, um, I kind of, the goal was basically to do pipeline floating point, which was, I guess, just a little bit novel at that time, but also to expand the parallelism to the next level, which was basically super scalar execution. Um, so pipeline risk processor plus pipeline floating point and, and also doing some SIMD operations. So, um, you know, it had like, combine, multiply, and accumulate operations, and also a special set of SIMD graphics instructions uh, <clears throat> for doing low-level pixel, um, like interpolation and Z buffer stuff. You also what did was, some... What was the goal of that product, and how did it fit with the other things going on at Intel? What was the application target? Um, High-performance scientific computing and graphics was the kind of goal. And we actually, when the chip came out, it kind of, it was like the first million transistor uh, microprocessor and it kind of caught people's attention. It was like my 15 minutes of fame. And they, um, it ended up, we got a lot of um, interest from first all these, um, uh, many computer companies that were doing scientific computing at that time. Um, there was a, a number of companies that are doing like parallel scientific computing, BLIW scientific um, computing, and um, they all kind of jumped on this um, this kind of microprocessor chip for for those kinds of applications. We also had designs at SGI that were using it for um, the three D. Um, the floating so, point part of the pipeline. So were you familiar with the world of graphics and graphics transformations and so forth? Was that yeah. along the way or? What? Yeah, and it was one of the targets that we had for it. I mean, obviously I ended up getting a lot more into that later on, but, but I understood the- Yeah, I was wondering whether- part of it. So how did that, uh, I read somewhere that the, the, the sort of real performance you had a hard time meeting the performance goals or the expectations um, versus sort of the theoretical uh, in sort of real world applications Is that what's your evaluation of that well um you have to understand that that project was it was not the mainstream project uh for intel and so it was extremely let's say understaffed in terms of <laughs> both on the chip design point of view, but especially on the software side and the compilers and stuff. So we, um, we end up um, you know, having to outsource all the compiler development, including we had Greenhill's um, work on the compiler. But it was, at that time, there was very limited understanding in the compiler world of how to take advantage of these kinds of um, highly pipeline architectures. And, and then on the, on the 860 side, you know, I have to say the instruction set wasn't particularly compiler friendly either. So um, those two things together made it difficult to have a compiled solution that worked efficiently. Now, if you, if you hand coded stuff, which I did for a few things, you know, like I, I did a JPEG um, decompression thing hand coded, 
you could actually get pretty good performance, but it, it wasn't um, easy enough for people to use. So what was your learning from that experience? What, what did you take away from that? Well, I mean, the, you definitely need to work um, early on on, on how, how you're going to handle the tool side of it, how, how to develop good compilers for it. And, um, and also, I mean, the importance of doing a lot of verification work during the uh, development process, which we just couldn't afford to do with the size of team we had. But, um, high, high level performance verification, that kind of thing? Sort of just system verification? Both, both performance and, um, and just logic verification. Mm. So you did some due diligence for Intel in acquisition of video compression technology from Sarnoff? Right. So that was a, a project that um, I think RCA had developed for doing these um, video discs, early, early video disc stuff. Um, and it was a kind of early vector quant kind of compression algorithms. Mm -hmm. And they had implemented a, um, a chip for it. And then they, I guess, decided to get out of that business and ended up selling that team to Intel. Mm -hmm. And that's how I uh, started looking at video compression and mm -hmm. how that might fit into future microprocessor stuff. So then the uh, next step was a startup. Huh? How did that happen? Right. Right. So, you know, I think um, after the 860 project was out there introduced into the market, um, because of some of the team dynamics, you know, we decided to try our luck in the startup world. And um, so a number of the early, um, like the other 860 project leaders, Sai Wai, Fu and I mm. spun out and, um, and um, <clears throat> my brother and some other people, uh, some Caltech guys uh, and some other um, people that we knew, we formed this company to do 860 based workstation. Um, because that was another kind of frustration at that time was that it was difficult to do that kind of a program inside of Intel, get the right people to work on it. They were also going through a financially rough time. I think there was a layoff and everything, I remember. Well, there was in the earlier eight, part of the 80s, but I think, right. yeah, as part, it was kind of just at the turning point of when they started, you know, the like, <clears throat> 486 really started to take off and um, but anyway so we we did spin out and original plan was that you know we would get Intel to go in with us and okay. bring in some other companies that had been working on 860 workstations to um, fund this thing but after we got out it it became apparent um, first of all, that you know, Intel just decided to go in another direction. I think partially because you know they didn't feel comfortable continuing 860 without the original people um, yeah. there anymore, and also um, you know, 486 was starting to take off. So that kind of killed the the 860 workstation program. So we then refocused on um, add-in boards and develop kind of early graphics adding card solution that we <clears throat> got funding from um, this company, Hercules, one of the early adding card companies for PC. What was the name of this company? Hercules. No, the name of the company you, found, you formed. Oh, it was called Aquest. Okay. And um, yeah, all the startups I've founded they all begin with A, <laughs> but um, this Hercules deal that we made, you know, was not not very favorable for us, and they ended up being able to sell cards 
against <laughs> to our customers, right? So we do all the business development, get the customer up and running, and then they come in and cut the price and undercut us, right? So it was not really a viable business. Right. So did you did you get any venture financing, or is it uh, no? We didn't. Or? We didn't. We we did attempt to, um, but uh, I think it was. It was too difficult given what Intel's direction was with A60. Mm -hmm. So um, if you're going to leave a chip company, don't do a company based on the chips that you just worked on. <laughs> <laughs> you just took all the people that made it viable. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so what was your, uh, so it basically, you suffered some business setbacks. You couldn't make a deal. What? So did the company fold? Did you just leave? What was the? Well, we just decided to shut it down. Basically, I mean, we we actually weren't bankrupt, but um, it was just so difficult to to scale the business given the deal that we had made and and what was happening with the H60. So we just uh, decided to move on. So Saiwai uh, also found some other, I think you went to Sun after mm -hmm. that. Saiwai went to Waytech. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think his wife was also at Intel. Uh, That's right, yeah. And she was there for much longer than us. Yeah, right. So then tell us about Sun. Right, so, um, I ended up, yeah, looking for what to do after a, a quest, and um, and then Sun was also, um, I guess, having some challenges in the microprocessor development. Um, they had developed this uh, thirty-two bit Spark um, several generations, but um, the high performance um, chips that were supposed to compete with Intel were were having problems. And so I came in to, uh, to lead the architecture for the, the first 64-bit microprocessor, right. which was the UltraSpark 1. And um, it was also um, interesting set of dynamics because there was a, a lot of different uh, microprocessor projects going on, including um, several things in Sun Labs and, and let's say again, I, I think the, the senior management of the company didn't understand chip design. Mm, right. So it was difficult for them to figure out what's the right uh, next direction to go in. And um, so um, the good thing about this project was there was a lot of resource and staffing available for it. and. Um, and I was able to kind of apply all the things that I'd learned working at Intel National, all the mistakes that I'd made and, and, and really um, uh, focus on, on making this project a success. So um, were, you were able to apply, you were finally able to do something risk-like and uh, Risk-like with the proper amount of staffing and proper methodology, et cetera. Um, and working with a really good team, of course. And also that always helps. Sorry? That always helps. Yes. And of course, it was very, uh, very fun to work with you know, Andy Bechtelsheim. I mean, the, the thing that was really nice about the Sun Project was you were also working with the system team in-house, right? And all the trade-offs could be made knowing exactly what kind of system you want to build out of it. Were you also interacting with Bill Joy? And yeah, Bill Joy on the architecture yeah. side, yes. Okay. So in terms of architecture uh, at that time, what was the thinking? I mean, performance-wise, um, risk-like, superscalar, uh, was there any attention to um, better compilers or better architectures? Uh, were there any considerations? 
uh, you have we are constrained to follow. Right. Well, so the when I joined the the V nine, which was the sixty four bit instruction set, right. That already had been pretty much defined, uh, along with the the um, like the <clears throat> memory management unit system architecture stuff, but the part of the instruction set that I did work on was this uh, Viz instruction set, which was a, another SIMD, hmm. um, like next generation SIMD instruction set. It was addressing both video processing to some extent, but also um, uh, floating point graphics, that kind of stuff. Um, and that was something, it wasn't really, it was still pretty controversial within Sun that this thing should even be done. I remember there, was, there were several graphics groups that were all fighting with each other. And uh, I aligned with one of them that, that believed in this kind of instruction set. Um, and Dave, Dave Ditzel was also there at that time. Yeah, the, he was on the lab side, with, okay. working on several other microprocessor projects. Um, but you didn't run into Roger Ross, right? In terms of any controversy about the 64-bit architecture, right? Because he was involved from international standpoint, Spark International. Right. Right. No, it was, yeah, it was pretty much, that part is pretty much worked out. Okay. So what were the, what did you say were the most innovative or unique aspects of this uh, UltraSpark uh, one? chip that you did? Um, well, it had a um, fully pipeline uh, L2 cache, which allowed you to you know, run fairly large um, data set scientific applications pretty efficiently. And this is something that, you know, again, we had a good compiler team and they, they managed to do a pretty good job of taking advantage of this um, along with, you know, the fully pipeline floating point four-way superscalar processing. Um, and we, I think the overall memory architecture, memory hierarchy was, you know, was well designed for, for large applications. A lot of, at that time, a lot of people were focused on, on, benchmark results and, and probably still today a lot of people focus on small benchmarks um, and it's difficult to to really understand how the system is going to perform with large applications and so one of the things that we spent a lot of time on was developing a, a simulation environment that could scale up to running like operating system plus application code um, and and measure performance in, in real applications. Um, so that gave us a much better understanding of the architecture trade-offs or the microarchitecture trade-offs um, to optimize. So a lot of uh, emphasis on web and uh, networking kind of issues because Sun was very- Well, web was still pretty early <laughs> at okay. that time. In fact, I, I remember that uh, Eric Schmidt almost banned web access. <laughs> I see. I didn't know. But um, it was um, definitely, you know, included full OS um, multiprocessing. That was another key um, thing that until I mean, uh, Sun was just starting to develop at that time was um, large scale multiprocessing servers. So there was a lot of work on both the cache coherency protocols and um, again, the operating system slash performance verification for that. So it sounds like this uh, chip development uh, went sort of largely as you envisioned coming in. You came in to do a, a project and you got to do that project and it was along the lines that you had come in to do. Is that correct? Is that a proper description? I would say so. I mean, it was it was a pretty challenging environment um, because, you know, like I said, the, the microprocessor side of things wasn't doing that well when we came in. There were all these competing projects and a lot right. of 
yeah. arguments about the direction. Um, but in the end, yeah, it did work out pretty well. I, I mean, it became sort of the mainstream mm -hmm. engine for Sun moving forward, right? right? Yeah. So, uh, what was the, what was the learning from this? What did you, uh, you know, what, uh, other than if you get a good team and you get control of all the pieces, it really can work out. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it was a validation of the methodology that was used, I think, for the for the project. Um, the other thing that personally I took away from it was that. Um, conventional microprocessor design was kind of reaching its limits. Mm. I mean, it was clear that um, you could do things like out of order execution, which was another kind of huge step in complexity. But beyond that, there wasn't a whole lot more you could do without just going to multiple processors, right? Um, and so it, it became kind of less interesting to me as a, as a future direction. And that's why I kind of decided to move into more um, application specific processing. And um, the other thing that was um, kind of difficult about it was you had to work with a really large team. And, Older Spark wasn't particularly large by Intel standards, but you know, you're talking about hundreds of people kind of projects and the dynamics of that is, is not quite as fun to me as, as smaller projects. So then what's, what was the step that caused you to move on to CQ? Um, well, part, partly because of this, uh, application specific focus. Um, right. And of course, um, it's working in video compression, which was an area that I was mm. interested in and look, looked quite promising. Um, it needs a lot of performance and smaller company and all that kind of stuff. So, so before you get onto that, I just want you wanted to pick up on the last comment you made. Uh, how would you describe the chip development environment in Sun versus Intel? Was it, you said it was a smaller big team, but still smaller than what Intel threw at it. Was that sort of structurally, you know, what, how would you compare them? Was Sun more efficient? Was it just different? Was it, you know, what was the... Um, yeah, I think they're more efficient. And, you know, I think since then, <clears throat> like the things that we've done at C-Cube and Umbrella to develop pretty complicated chips with much smaller teams shows that, yeah, you can be a lot more efficient than than what Intel is doing. Um, you know, to some extent, these things, it's like all these bureaucracies, right? They always grow over time and, and people tend to make things um, overly complicated. I think it has some historic precedence, meaning Intel and other like national yeah. probably had large teams because of the methodologies and tools. Well, and of course they are very successful in that business. They could afford to have large teams. Um, right. And in fact, when I went back to Sun the second time, the teams had also gotten much larger and I think also <laughs> less efficient. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. All right, so uh, anyway, you were moving on to CQ. Yeah. yeah. So were you, were you recruited there? Did you uh, seek them out? Yeah, well, actually, um, Sai Wai Fu had, had joined CQ uh, before me. So yeah, he, he recru recruited me in there. And Bill O'Mara was there, right? Wasn't yes. It? Okay. Did you know him before? Or? Briefly, I mean, he, I think he was leaving as I joined. Okay. Or it wasn't, we didn't overlap too much. Okay. So uh, what, what were you brought in to do was... Uh, oh, um, originally, I, I actually... Uh, sorry? What was the state of C-Cube at the time? Yeah, so C-Cube, um, <clears throat> they were kind of an early pioneer in the um, MPEG-based video compression space. So um, my boss there was a guy named Didier Legal who was the chairman of the um, video MPEG committee that developed the standard for um, MPEG-1 and MPEG-2. 
And um, <clears throat> so he was a, you know, an expert on video compression. He had a team there that had been involved in, in some of the standards development and had kind of the state of the art video compression algorithms understanding. And um, uh, so they, their business basically was two main things. One was a set of video decompression chips for consumer applications, um, you know, like a video CD or DVD or set-top box. And then they had this compression family of chips, which at that time was mainly um, being used for broadcast applications. So they had actually um, developed the first generation of MPEG, um, MPEG-2 compression for DirecTV that was used for the, all the original DirecTV deployment and, um, and other kinds of early um, digital broadcasting um, systems. And this, this thing was developed as a multi-chip. It was like a humongous board full of chips and FPGAs um, to, to do a single channel of standard definition uh, video compression. So the project I was hired in was to basically come in and um, develop a single chip replacement for that uh, board full of stuff and have better quality at the same time. So I originally um, started working there as a consultant, um, but after a few months, you know, I decided it was pretty interesting. So I decided to join them. Yes, and you were there for about six years. Um, yeah, that's right. So while I was there, um, I met um, uh, Fermi Wang, who is uh, the guy that he, he was basically running the software side of all the projects that I was working on there. Um, and he became a general manager and very interested in, in business side of things. And um, so uh, the two of us decided to go out and do startup together mm. around 2000. So that was a far. Yeah. Okay. Along with, uh, I mean, a far was actually originally um, started by Kunle Olukuntin uh, Stanford. Okay. Right. 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 And uh, yeah, we joined him. So what did, what were the major takeaways from your CCube experience? What? Uh... Um, well, that it, first that you could do these large projects um, with a much smaller team, um, especially if you understand, the key thing is to understand the problem that you're trying, the algorithms um, that you're using to solve a particular problem really well so that you can optimize the architecture for that. And then you can, you know, not waste time developing a lot of general, general purpose things that aren't particularly efficient um, and are very, very complicated to implement. Um, so that was one key thing. And um, I think we, we, we got to try a few things like we, we had an early 3D um, technology project that unfortunately didn't uh, make it out. But um, I, I just learned a lot about how to um, come up with really efficient, both from internal processing, but um, whole memory system hierarchy, uh, efficient processing algorithms for graphics and video video process. So your uh, um, desire to do multiprocessing came to fruition in um, the FAR, right? I mean, that's, that was the basic. Yeah, so if, what was intriguing to me about Afara was that it represented a, another way to scale performance without having to implement a super complex pipeline. Um, so the idea was to um, use multi-threaded, fairly simple pipelines, but use multi-threading um, to scale the performance up 
and that multi-threading could cover the uh, memory latency that you have with cache misses um, more effectively than, than what you can do with an out of order uh, pipeline. And I think this has actually been proven out when you look at like the way GPUs work, uh, modern GPU architectures, they use super large number of threads to, to basically do that, that exact same thing. Um, but we were using it for, um, for server applications, uh, particularly for uh, web processing. And, um, you know, that's, again, a case where you have aggregation of a large number of clients that are coming in. And so optimizing the throughput of those clients um, um, works. You don't, you don't need to have super low latency for each client. So go ahead. Going into this, it seems like you, I mean, Sun was a dominant supplier in the web systems, web server business at the time, right? Yep, they were. So you, that, that was your primary target that you were aiming against? Um, <clears throat> yes, although I think at that time, um, PC architecture was starting to, to become very competitive in that space um, because you had, um, you know, you had the Pentium Pro and, and the follow-on chips that were actually quite competitive with any, any processors that Intel, I mean, uh, Sun had developed. So you were gonna do a new processor and build a system around that to yes. really focus on this? Mm -hmm. Of course, it was during the peak of the dot-com boom, right? So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> the thing everyone had to do. <clears throat> But, a, but a, it's still a major undertaking to develop a new yeah. microprocessor compiler's operating system and insert it yeah. in the Yeah, I mean, you know, we were leveraging a lot of open source development that was, I guess, really becoming popular at that point. So we were using Linux, we we're using open source um, web servers and so on. Um, and we, we used Spark architecture, so we had, you know, the compilers and stuff for that were all all there. I see. Yeah, I was going to ask about the compiler because they get more complex as you go. Well, the, the beauty of this um, multi-threading stuff is you don't need a good compiler for that. Um, mm. It just, the way the application is written naturally has all the threading in it okay. because they, that's what they have to use anyway for scaling. Right. Okay, so anything else? I think you then got absorbed into Sun. Uh, I was there. I was one of the people that did the due diligence. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, but before you do that, so what what happened? You were. It looks like you were. Uh... So we were. We had raised one round of funding at the peak, right, of the dot com thing, and then then two thousand one September eleventh happened, and uh, we were. Fermi and I were actually on the way to New York City, driving into New York City when the planes hit and um, mm -hmm. we saw the smoke coming out of the, the Twin Towers. Um, wow. But that basically just killed the fundraising um, for us. And you know, we ended up having to sell the company. And mm -hmm. So we decided. I, I, I had a a similar experience. I also had a VC presentation scheduled for that day mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, it didn't go well. <laughs> well, number one, it was delayed by a day and number two, it didn't, didn't pan out after that. <laughs> Tough time. And of course, on the sun side, they were running into the clock speed and power issue. And that was really the motivation for- Right. Okay, so Sun scooped in, uh, swooped in to scoop you up. What, um, what specifically were they looking for, and what solution did you provide? So they, they were interested in this multi-threaded microprocessor that we were developing. Um, although I have to say, again, there was a lot of competing projects going on, mm -hmm. um, and so 
you know, I did have to kind of fight to keep that project going intact or as intact as possible. Right. Um, and fortunately, yeah, we were able to, to do that. Um, it was, uh, <clears throat> let's say it was scaled back a bit from what we were originally trying to build, um, but it, you know, it did come out and it, I think was pretty uh, competitive at the time that it came out with uh, other processors um, for, for these kinds of applications. And then the, their roadmap actually changed to that. You know, they, they right. killed some of the other projects and right. continued next generation of that T1 and so on. Right. So did you find some familiar environment coming back after? Actually, it was both familiar and quite different from <laughs> when I was there the first time. Um, I mean, a lot of the people were there, but that I knew, but um, the company had grown quite, let's say, bureaucratic, uh, unfortunately. And um, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to get into all the dirt, but it, let's say coming from a startup company um, where you're used to moving fast and making quick decisions, it was quite a shock. And uh, yeah. after a year, I decided not not to stay there anymore. But you stayed long enough to establish that as sort of the main path for Sun going right. forward. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know? So you did that twice. You uh, sort of got them onto new paths uh, with your two uh, times yeah. at Sun. That's uh, quite an accomplishment. Yep. So that uh, also convinced you that you didn't want to do a big company. You wanted uh, you enjoyed the smaller uh, right. environment. Right. So Fermi and I decided, yes, it's time for another startup. <laughs> <laughs> and how did that evolve? How did you come to a uh, conclusion as to what the next step was? So um, after we both left Sun, um, we, we became EIRs at Benchmark um, because the former um, C-Cube CEO, Alex Balkansky was a partner there. And so we, we looked around at various um, opportunities um, and we ended up coming to uh, an opportunity that looked intriguing, which was <clears throat> at that time, um, there was a new video compression standard that was just being finalized um, called uh, H.264. And this, um, this standard we realized could enable you to record um, high quality video onto a, a regular flash card, right, memory. So use very uh, low cost uh, storage. Um, you could record an hour or more of video onto it. And that enabled you to essentially combine the functions of um, video recording, digital camcorder kinds of functions with um, digital still camera technology, which was digital still camera was really taking off around that time. Um, people were replacing all the film cameras with digital still camera, but the video cameras were still like tape based or you know, big clunky things that, that you had to have a separate camera to carry around. So we said, why not combine those two things together and, and uh, just have a much more convenient um, camera device. So that's the premise that we, we started the company with. So, and so you were gonna develop a chip to... That would basically provide high quality uh, image processing for the camera side. And <clears throat> then you could either store those images as JPEG files for still images or as um, H.264 video files. And your previous experience, you had a pretty clear view of how to do that. Was there any? Well, we, we under, certainly understood the, let's say the general um, processing required for video compression. We, we had actually no experience in image processing when we started the company. Um, so that's something we learned a lot in the, in the job. And the other thing is because H.264 was a new standard, um, people really didn't believe you could implement it 
in a portable power envelope. So it, it was again, one of these things that at the time <clears throat> when we started the company, the implementation of a single HD channel um, was um, like a refrigerator size box with, <laughs> with tons of DSP chips and FPGAs and stuff. And um, we managed to get that down to something that could run on a battery operated device. And that was your goal. I mean, that was your goal going in and, and you were able to accomplish that. How long did that take? Yeah. Um, so we had a really, really good chip team this time. Um, <laughs> and we, um, we got the first chip back within about two years when we started the company. So this was a small, high-performing team well, for yes. a small, high-performing chip or a large house. How big was this chip? Oh, let me see here. <clears throat> um, I don't recall exactly. this. The first chip that we did was on 0.13 microns, so pretty you know, pretty loose by today's standards, but um, I believe it was around maybe 70, 80 millimeters in size. And um, so very, one of the thi sorry, very cost effective. Not, I mean, not physically too large. Yeah, I mean, of course, we end up, you know, when we got to high volume production, you know, we got it down to like 20 millimeters or stuff. But um, the novel thing that we did that was a mistake in hindsight was we used this uh, embedded DRAM technology because we wanted to have, in order to um, make the DRAM uh, usage efficient, we wanted to have a large on-chip memory um, for that. And so we decided to use this, this embedded 1T um, DRAM technology, which never really worked properly. <laughs> so. <laughs> Luckily, we managed to uh, survive it. <laughs> Did you eventually put it off chip or use static technology? We replaced it with, with SRAM, yeah. Yeah. And uh, so was that chip, you launched that chip, was the opening salvo, was that a big success? Is that, uh, so, yeah, so it, it turned out um, that where the big success was for the first chip was um, in broadcast uh, encoding. So. You know, as I mentioned, the existing systems were these humongous, um, humongous, like refrigerator-sized boxes that were very expensive and very uh, inefficient. So we, um, because of we knew people, you know, that had been working on the broadcast uh, encoders, and when <clears throat> they evaluated this chip against their their large boxes, they found the video quality was actually better and you know, <laughs> single chip. So, you know, that thing just took off. It was a instant success in that space. And um, it, even though it's not super high volume, it's very profitable because it's you know, broadcast um, professional equipment. And um, so it funded really the company to grow for the first few years. Are you still making that chip? No, not that one. <laughs> well, we still sell a few broadcast chips, but it's, you know. So what was the evolution? That was one that launched, or what was the... So <clears throat> the, after the first chip, we, we did this kind of cost down of that chip um, that was actually used in a consumer um, camcorder device. Um, as it turns out, our, our original idea of combining the, the still camera and the video camera um, from a business point of view was challenging because the still camera space was dominated by um, these large Japanese um, camera companies, you know, the Nikon, Canon, that kind of company. And they were very, um, let's say conservative and slow moving. And it, one of the big, challenges we had in the early days was that they were all using for <clears throat> these um, CCD image sensors. And CCDs are, are nice for still camera, but they're not good for video. 
and we wanted them to switch to CMOS sensors. And it eventually happened, but it, it took a long time. And so we ended up really focusing more on the uh, digital video camera in the early stages, pocket, like these pocket camcorders. And um, <clears throat> we were pretty successful in getting that market going until um, basically the cell phone started to do video, yeah. good video. And um, after that happened, we ended up kind of migrating into other segments that cell, cell phones couldn't address. And I think the first really big success was the sports camera segment. Um, the GoPro, you know, pioneered that segment and we worked with them very closely in the early days um, to, to develop, you know, these very high quality, but very portable and, uh, and robust cameras. So is that because they were, they in fact did want to combine still and video and use CMOS? Sensor? Um, well, they were more video centric than still. Of course you can take still, um, but they, they really needed something that was low power because the, you know, you had a very small um, physical size and it's in a sealed case, right? So the cooling is extremely difficult. Right. So um, that was a perfect fit for, our technology. Um, and then of course we could still provide very high quality video from that. So the company is located here? Um, so the company, actually even at the very beginning of the company, we decided to try to use a kind of hybrid um, Silicon Valley Asian model. And, okay. um, you know, Fermi is from Taiwan and we have right. A lot of people who have a lot of contacts there. So we set up uh, office in Taiwan from the beginning. Okay. And we actually have the bulk of our team there right now. We also have um, teams in China and uh, Italy. Hmm. Engineering teams. Okay. And you're using the fab and um... TSMC or? Well, we started with TSMC for the first few generations and then we uh, end up moving to Samsung. Okay. Um, so how did you wind up in Italy? We acquired a team in, in 2015. Um, we, you know, we had decided that we wanted to um, really focus on um, um, opportunities in automotive as one of our major uh, markets because there's a large number of cameras in the car. And then of course the other major uh, development is that um, you know, computer vision and AI processing um, is, is being used for all the camera stuff. So we, um, we wanted to understand all the algorithms that are involved in doing a full autonomous driving stack. You know, because as I mentioned, we'd like to really optimize architecture based on a good understanding of the core algorithms. And there was a team in, uh, in Parma, Italy called VizLab, which um, was started by uh, a professor there who actually started working on autonomous driving in the mid nineties uh, and was one of the early pioneers in the space. He, uh, his team was involved in the DARPA grand challenges and did things like drive autonomously from Parma to Shanghai. Oh, wow. On this multi-month road trip. Um, <laughs> so they had a very uh, good team that understood the full, full stack and uh, we, they, they, at that time in 2015, were running into the problem that they had a trunk full of PCs um, to do the processing for all the camera and, and that they needed to figure out how to shrink that down to something that was reasonable. So we were a natural fit, right? And we've been working together to um, come up with the ultimate chip for that application. How about uh, drones? We also been... Yeah, we, um, so after the sports camera market, we, um, yeah, we ended up 
also becoming involved in the drone market um, for camera um, for camera processing, and we still you know we're still involved in, in that today. It's it's not as big of a market, obviously, as as um, sports camera or or the other markets that we're focusing on now. Yeah, you know, I was just watching a cricket match between India and Australia, and a lot of the drones are used for sports interviewing mm -hmm. and stuff. Yeah. Really I mean, they definitely have their niche, very, very interesting applications. <clears throat> I guess because of regulations and, you know, it, it hasn't become as mainstream as... as right. So uh, how did you, was, so it was through this group in Italy that you got into the sort of the AI processing and- Well, we stuff. had, we were working on AI processing from the um, you know, more generic computer vision and AI processing before that, but um, we really got into understanding the full stack with, with this team and of course, they also brought a lot of computer vision um, expertise as well, particularly in stereo processing. Um, but we, you know, I think it's it's really across the company at this point all the AI development. Is that uh, increasing element in your chips moving forward? Then it's the dominant element. Yes, now. The other stuff is becoming a small, small piece of it. <laughs> so that's a good uh, segue into future of uh, architectures. Uh, what can you tell us a little bit from your perspective? What's what's evolving and so on? Sure. Um, well, I mean, <clears throat> I think it's pretty clear now that all the really high performance scaling that's going on is happening outside of the CPU. Um, you know, GPU was the first really mainstream example of that. Um, but I think as we go into AI, you know, it's time to move beyond G GPU into um, architectures that are optimized for AI processing. Um, and that's, it's one of these things that you can just soak up an arbitrary amount of compute power. And so you better come up with the most efficient solution for that. Um, and I think, you know, it's people, they look at the AI, like convolutional neural net and they say, I hear a lot of people say, oh, it's just a matrix multiply, right? And anybody can do a matrix multiply, but, but actually um, throwing a bunch of multipliers and adders down doesn't solve the problem. You have to be able to um, handle a wide range of different configurations of, of networks. And there's all different kinds of bottlenecks that show up when you, when you do that um, and keeping these the data pass busy is, is really where the key challenge is. Um, so if you look at the efficiency of these networks running on a GPU, you'll, you'll see that when you really look at how many multiply accumulates they're actually doing versus the raw hardware capability, you'll see it's, it's not very good efficiency. Mm. Um, so um, we're all about trying to optimize efficiency and, um, and still provide an a high degree of flexibility so that you can run different kinds of networks. And that, that's a kind of big challenge. Right. So that, that involves the memory architecture and-, and Definitely uh, memory is a big part of that. Hmm. Big part of that. Okay. So, so you've been at this for 14 years. This is a- Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> my longest job, yes. <laughs> By a long way. <laughs> So uh, is this, you know, you see yourself uh, continue to be challenged and yeah. architecture alternatives and so forth going forward? I mean, uh, yeah, we're working on some monster sized chips right now, which um, yeah, are quite interesting and fun. Right. So do you have any um, 
words of wisdom for the generation that is starting their careers, uh, what kind of things they should work on. You know, of course, you have a very nice perspective. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, I, we often talk about whether we do another chip company. And, uh, <laughs> It's, it's getting hard, right? Because um, the industry is becoming more and more consolidated and the level of investments required is becoming larger and larger. Um, so I don't know whether there'll be a renaissance at some point, but right now I would say it's probably difficult to do that as a startup and, and software is a lot more attractive opportunity. Um, <clears throat> But I do think that we have to be careful that you don't just become like in software, it's very easy to stay at a super high level and use libraries of, of code that you don't really understand what's going on inside those libraries. And, um, you know, everything is fine as long as you can find the right function in the library to do it for you. But if you have to do something new and at some point <laughs> that always happens, right? You know, we, we need we need people who still understand how the stuff really works underneath. And that's, you know, like compiler level, operating system level, and, and what's going on inside these chips. And various applications, whether it's in the medical field or data analytics or mm -hmm. different domains, uh, the kind of solutions that have to be found, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it's always, if you really want to come up with an efficient solution for something, you, you need to have a good understanding of how things work you know, at a deep level right. to, to really understand the bottlenecks. I think the, you know, the, the uh, launch of neural networks and so forth, stuff that uh, finally sort of came to the fore after uh, people realize what could be done, you know, has actually launched a large number of uh, quote unquote AI chip companies. Yes, uh, that's true. Few will be successful, but at least the sort of this new, do this new architectural domain, you know, getting out of the CPU world and even the GPU world is uh, at least opened up uh, opportunities for people to explore. But as usual, there'll probably only be a few that are successful. That's right, yeah. Right. It's like same thing happened in the video compression space. There was, I don't remember how many MPEG compression chip companies, maybe 20 or 30, and probably only a couple actually shipped in volume. Yeah, yeah. So any other last minute uh, words that you want to talk about? Mm, well, I don't know. Has, has Umbrella gotten too big to uh, and become bureaucratic or have you? Well, you know, we, <laughs> <laughs> I think we've had our challenges, right, over the years um, as, as markets shift around. And, you know, I mentioned the cell phone was one big challenge. Um, and consumer things tend to, you know, another big challenge for us was consumer grows fast, but, it, you know, saturates out and then you have to transition to something else. So we haven't grown so fast that we've become super bureaucratic. We've, we've had to stay fairly nimble. Um, so how many people are there? A uh, total of around 700 okay. people. Yeah. And most of those are in Asia? Yes. Um, but I do think um, if you're lucky enough to, to get to work on interesting projects um, that you can keep going for a long time. A lot of people think, you know, you can only be an engineer for maybe, um, you know, after you're 35 or something, you're gonna have to become a manager or something. Not necessarily the case. You're proving them wrong. <laughs> yeah. Lifetime of engineering innovation. So that was wonderful. Thank you, Les. Sure, my pleasure. Yeah, great for all the insights and uh, hearing your story. And it uh, sounds like you've made a tremendous contribution to uh, various companies in the industry. And we appreciate your uh, time and sharing it with us. Thanks, hope it's useful for some people. <laughs> I think it will be. All right, thank Thanks you very much. See you. Thank you very much. <laughs>